Edwin Frondozo on the Business Leadership Podcast every week for a unique program featuring insights and actionable items from the world's most successful business leaders. Hear firsthand the exclusive interviews and personal journeys on how today's transformational leaders made it to the top. Hey everybody, it's me, it's Edwin, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Business Leadership Podcast. My guest today is Julia Deans. She's the CEO of Futurepreneur. It's an organization that helped almost 10,000 Canadians launch startups with business coaching, financing, mentoring, and other resources. Julia started her career as a lawyer with Tories LLP in Toronto and Hong Kong before creating a successful legal recruitment business in Singapore. In 2005, she became CEO of Civic Action, a cross-sector leadership coalition that has successfully tackled major social, economical, and environmental challenges in the Toronto area, a role where she had to recruit John Tory, who is now Toronto's mayor, as the chair of the organization. And in 2012, she chaired Ontario's expert roundtable on immigration, helping develop the province's first ever immigration strategy. What I found most interesting is that she shared with me before the interview that she actually lived in the Philippines, a country where my parents come from and lived very close to where my mother grew up. So before getting started, I want to send a shout out and thank you to my media partners, IT World Canada, for the support of the podcast. So enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Julia. Thanks so much, Edwin. Well, thank you for taking the time to join me on the Business Leadership Podcast. Can you share with us, for the listeners who may not know you or the organization, a little bit about yourself? Tell us who Julia is and what does Julia like to do? I'm a native Torontonian, which makes me a bit unusual because we're a city where over 50% of the people came from another country. Uh, but I'm from downtown to Toronto. I love to travel. I love to meet pe people. I love to connect people. I've uh, done a lot of different things in my career and uh, found myself back in, in Toronto uh, continuing to do interesting things. Well, again, thank you for your time. Really excited to have you. And I know we're going to get more into future premieres. So why don't we just start off there? Tell us about your current role and the current mission. Uh, Futurepreneur Canada is an organization that is devoted to helping young people realize that they can become entrepreneurs and realize that there's somebody there to help them do it. And that's our mission. And I'm the CEO. We're a staff of about 95 spread across 15 locations in Canada. So we're truly coast to coast. So as an entrepreneur who's also involved in the startup scene where I mentor volunteer and support. I'm truly amazed with the amount of support and focus that is that is currently happening now. So from your point of view, what are the major challenges that young entrepreneurs are facing today? There is a lot going on. It's not going on absolutely everywhere. So there, there are places that are like the land of plenty in Toronto or Waterloo or Montreal. Uh, but there are a lot of places where there isn't as much activity. So we, we need to look at, at, at all those spots as well. Um, I think what's really exciting is that more young people are, are seeing entrepreneurs and thinking that, that maybe that's something they can do, but they still have uh, real barriers in having the confidence to take that first step. And then once they decide to take that first step, they may, maybe not know what to do. They don't have the skills. A lot of us have gone through school without having any financial management training, no coding or things that might be helpful for entrepreneurs. So the first part of the journey can be a little bit tricky, just getting your confidence together and either developing the skills or finding people who can help you learn those things and help you with those, those uh, aspects. What has been successful providing these confidence to, to entrepreneurs that, that passed the the three-year mark, the five-year mark, from your experience? So that's for growing entrepreneurs. Uh, a huge part is making sure they get a good start. So lots of people have business ideas. The ones who decide to take it forward usually need quite a lot of help to de develop a plan that's actually going to, to work out for them. Once they get launched, though, it's, it's not all that easy, as you know, <laughs> better than a lot of people, um, especially in the second year. It can be really, really tough. So one of the things we do is match people with a volunteer mentor for up to two years. And that person's there 
they're not interested in your business uh, financially. They're just interested in making you successful and making your business successful. And they can help you through those spots where you're starting to lose confidence. Something's not gone right. You need to get things back on track. And mentors are a big part of the growth of any young entrepreneur, I think. A hundred percent. And I, as I mentioned, I also mentor and I mentor future media entrepreneurs as well. I find the challenges that many entrepreneurs come from is, is just having that person to bounce things off of. And through the program, is, is that the number one thing that the entrepreneurs who go through this are looking for? Well, at first they're looking for someone to help help them figure out how do I bring my business idea and actually open the doors and have have a start? How do I get the money to do this? So that's that sort of job one. Then after that, it's, oh my gosh, I, I don't know how to manage people or I don't know where I'm going to get more money or uh, the sales aren't happening the way I thought they were going to happen. And, and you may have had some of those questions yourself. And having someone there who who usually is an experienced entrepreneur themselves to, to say, here, here are some things that you might try. Here's what I'm hearing. Here are some people who might help you think about this. Oh my gosh, that can be so huge when you're trying to get through those first few years. You started your career as a lawyer. I mean, working between Toronto and Hong Kong and eventually, you became an entrepreneur. You started a business in Singapore. So how did that experience help you grow as the business leader? Uh, well, unlike some people, I'm a pretty big believer in getting some basic professional training at the beginning of your career. So for me, being able to work at a law firm at Tories was huge because I learned how an organization works. And not that I loved everything about it, but at least I know what, what good looks like and, and what an organization needs to, to keep moving forward. Uh, so that was great for me. Then when I was in, in Asia, uh, I was still working with Tories. They decided to close their office in Hong Kong. I moved to Singapore and I had this opportunity to do something entrepreneurial. And I thought, well, this would be really cool to see if I could build a business and make money. And uh, 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 it was a huge opportunity for me. It was hugely successful. And I learned a ton along the way. Great. So take me through that. Like the organization that you're working at closes, was that opportunity there, what were the emotions that were happening as well? And did you have to think about that? Was that opportunity just waiting for you? No, I made a huge mistake along the way. So Tories uh, had gone to Asia when lots of Canadian businesses were going there for the first time and they wanted their Canadian lawyers beside them. And by the late 80s, early 90s, they didn't need their, their lawyers from Canada there. So Tories decided we're going to close our office. And I was such a diehard. I love Tories. I couldn't imagine working anywhere else. Uh, so when it, when we closed the office, I couldn't imagine going to another law firm. So I did a, a rebound job, which which you may ha or may not have done before. But it's uh, it's when you go to something that really isn't the right opportunity. But um, you you think I got to go somewhere here looks like a good place. So I went to a, a job that was really not a good job and lasted about three weeks. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's definitely, that sounds like a total rebound, but, it, but you, sometimes you just need that, right? Yeah. So we were living in Hong Kong. Then the handover happened when China uh, took back Hong Kong, big changes. And we had an opportunity to move to, to Singapore. And uh, I moved there and I phoned the leading legal recruiter back in Hong Kong and said, here I am in Singapore. What should I do? And he said, oh, great. You'll be on a plane every week going to other countries because nobody actually practices law in Singapore if you're foreign. He said, or you could open our offices for us in Southeast Asia. And I thought, well, that could be pretty interesting. I love to connect people. I'd like to prove that I could make money and start a business. So why not? So that's what I did. Well, that's amazing. So you came from being a lawyer, practicing law, to starting and growing a firm as well. Running Futurepreneur, an organization that helps entrepreneurs, do you see a lot of the challenges that you had as well um, when you reflect back? Oh, absolutely. I know what it's like to have to figure out everything from where are we going to be to how are we going to get our first clients to who am I going to have working with me to how am I going to pay the bills to how am I going to market my business. So that's all still very, very close at hand. Um, and I think the bigger thing I learned was how to talk to people who are at very different stages and, and ages. So I can I can talk to just about anybody from an 18 year old who's thinking about starting a business to a bank CEO who maybe we want money from to help run run our organization and help people. So uh, all those learnings are so, so valuable to me now. No, and it's very refreshing for the CEO of Future Panera to to have been uh, who's gone through the challenges and through the trenches, per se. I'm really interested. I'm really curious if you could think of any of this, any specific milestones or, or perhaps any roadblocks that clearly defined you 
uh, with the necessary building blocks of, of being a business leader today? As I said, everything is kind of added up. I think the, 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 my real defining experience as a leader came when I worked at an organization called Civic Action. And uh, that's a not-for-profit that brings together leaders from all different sectors to take on really thorny problems facing the Toronto region, like how do we integrate skilled immigrants into our workforce? How do we get commercial buildings to use less energy? How do we help um, emerging leaders take their place faster and in, in a more diverse way than we've done before? So really big issues. And I was the CEO and our chair was an amazing man named David Pico, who was also a partner at BCG. And he was the most charismatic, amazing man to work with. And then he got very ill and he died when he was only 54. And for so many people, he was, he, he was the rock of that organization. He'd been there so long. And I realized I had to look at myself and say, are you, can, can I keep this organization going? And uh, I was so devastated personally because I adored him. Um, but I thought I can do this and nobody else could. And I had to, I had to do it. And so for about a year, I went through the most grueling time of my life, but I was the one saying we can keep going. It can be a slightly different model. We will bring new leaders into the fold, but we can carry on. And, and we were able to do it. So that for me was, um, it showed me that I have resilience and I can overcome pretty big obstacles. And as a leader, that's, that's kind of what you have to do an awful lot of the time. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, resilience is a, is a word I hear a lot on the podcast from people I speak to other leaders. And with regards to civic action, not only were you leading this non-for-profit, you were working with leaders across the country, correct? So yeah, mainly in the GTA, but many of the GTA leaders are the leaders of the country. And so they were very powerful people, but believe it or not, they don't always know how to work across sectors either. So we had to figure out how do you, how do you get a bank CEO to sit next to a poverty activist, to sit next to a university president and, and come up with a solution to poverty, um, come up with a solution to income disparity. Uh, and we were able to do that. So you, you need a particular skill set to do that. And, and that was what Civic Action really helped me develop. Were the, during the transition from taking over and really leading this, and you had to, you mentioned you had to find other executives, other leaders as well. Was there a lot of kickback, a lot of changeover as you took over as, as the leader? No, I was, so I was the CEO and I, I stayed being the CEO. J David had been the chair. So he was, he was a, a lot of the outer face. And, um, so I probably took on more of that, but I had, a, I had a lot of people who wanted us to succeed around me and, uh, but didn't quite know how to do it. So my job was to get them to help me. Uh, one of the biggest things I did was, uh, recruit John Tory to come and be the new chair a big thing for him to do because at the time he was trying to decide whether to run for mayor. And um, had he done that, we might not have had Rob Ford. So it was a pretty big decision, but he became the chair of civic action. He was superb at that. And I think we've got a really, really strong mayor as a result because he saw through civic action, all, all the things that we have in the city to, to do and to take advantage of. You're also chair of the Ontario's expert Roundtable on immigration where you helped develop the province first ever immigration strategy. So can you share with us how, how you got involved and the challenges leading that type of initiative? Yeah, well, it's, um, it was, I had done a fair amount of work on immigrant integration at, at Civic Action. Um, and we started a number of initiatives to help skilled immigrants get their first job. So it was an area that I knew a lot about and care a huge amount about, um, especially being the daughter of an immigrant myself. And, and, and I really am pretty passionate about how, how well we do, uh, with immigrants. Um, I had left Civic Action because it was time for my next thing. So people were aware that I was available. And Ontario needed someone to help them figure out what, what should our immigration strategy be? In the past, immigrants had just come to Ontario. It was like a magnet. And many of them were skilled uh, people with money, starting businesses, etc. Uh, and the complexion of our immigration had changed. And so the province needed to have a strategy to figure out how, how to attract the best people, how to make use of them. So it was, it was a great chance for me to, to really 
put my mark on this. Uh, they put together a, a, a task force, if you will, of, of really superb people. And my job was to get those people all to work together and to contribute. And they were so good that that wasn't hard. Uh, the hardest thing was figuring out how do we interact with the government because they had certain things they wanted to do, certain limitations. And they could very well have turned around and said, thank you so much for your report. Goodbye. Uh, but instead, they really embraced it because we worked so well with them along the way. They um, took the strategy and adopted it almost whole scale. And then they um, introduced legislation to enshrine it. So it was a pretty big success. Julia, the list that does not end in terms of your involvement with non-for-profits. Uh, you're, you're working with the International Women's Forum Canada, which is an organization that has a mission to bring together accomplished women across Canada to develop and exercise women's leadership and to leverage our, our global network. So I'm interested to know how this organization, what, how you feel is it helping other women grow as a leader? Well, it was started when uh, women leaders were pretty few and far between, and it was designed to create networks of those leaders. And it's done a pretty good a job of that. But now the challenges are a little bit more nuanced. How do we help women who have shown that they're leaders exercise that leadership in other places? And a big part of that is is being on uh, uh, boards of, of companies. And in Canada, we still have an awful lot of companies that have all male boards or boards with one or two women. And the, the evidence is pretty clear that that your organization is not going to do as well as it would if you had more women on your board. We have women who want to serve on boards. So a big part of our, our mandate is is uh, encouraging and equipping women leaders to, to play a more active role on boards and trying to make a case for that with the boards to say, go out and find women. You no longer have the excuse that there aren't any talented women available. That's just nonsense. And uh, uh, so that's a part of the mandate that really excites me. The other is to bring along women leaders and to help them get into more senior roles faster than they might if they don't have our help. So um, it's it's pretty exciting work and it's connected with similar uh, organizations all around the world. So uh, we, we we can learn from from our, our sisters uh, in other other countries and, and help our, our Canadian women to to achieve more. Well, it's interesting, the challenge. And just talking a little more, I had a discussion with another um, woman leader and she talked about women women executives. It was Eva Wong. She's the co-founder of one of the fintech companies here. She was one of our uh, diversity fellows when I was at Civic Action, which is, yeah, yeah I, I know her well. So it, it, in her podcast, when, we, when I interviewed her, she talked about, um, and maybe you have some thoughts on this, executives or boards, it's not that people may want diversity, but everyone's busy. So they just end up filling the role. And she's very an advocate of just making sure being top of mind that you need to fill these roles with women and do that. So is it more so that women have to speak up more, just be top of mind, or is it coming from both sides now? I think it's coming from both sides and, and, and you're right. And, and she's right. So often when people are looking to fill a board seat, they turn to people they know, or they turn to people they know and say, who do you know? And the people they know are the people they saw in the last week. And if they look like them, then that's who you're going to, you're going to get. So, uh, I think there's an onus on people of color and, and women and other people who are underrepresented to put their hands up and say, here I am. And if there are avenues to, to get to those board seats, to, to get into those avenues. And one great example is, uh, diversity on board, uh, which is a roster of, of qualified people of color willing to serve on boards of every size. And similarly, if you're a board to say, maybe we need to go a step further and look at some unusual suspects for our board and get some help to do it. Maybe you're a big board and you can afford to hire a recruiter. Great. Maybe you're a not-for-profit board like ours, and you have to reach out a little beyond your traditional networks and say, we have a board role. Here's the sort of person that you're looking for. Can, can, uh, can you help? And my, my experience is if you ask people to share their networks, they do it, but you really have to just go out and ask. Right. No, it's, it's something that I'm becoming more aware of, a little more passionate about, especially with the business leadership podcast, uh, having a young daughter almost turning one. And I want to show her that in her world, it's all equal. 
by by the time we get there, or it's very easy to get into these roles, and it's something that I'm I'm thinking about, and maybe I never thought about, it, and I always thought I was a diverse person the way I thought, and yeah, and it's just coming closer to home, I guess, for me. Yeah, and for us, we had uh, I think there was one woman on my board when I joined Futurepreneur, and we now have a, a, a slew of amazing women, including one who's a young entrepreneur, Devin Brooks from BC. She started the Blow Hair Dry Bars. And she's amazing. She's a mentor to a number of our future printers. And um, she was, I think, 28. And I said, I'd love to have you on the board. Love to have your perspective. And boy, uh, fresh energy. Everybody loves having her on the board. And she's just stepped right up. And it's it's huge for us to get that perspective in, in how we lead the organization. Who are your biggest influences when it comes to business leadership? Well, David Pico, who, who as I mentioned, was the, the founding chair of Civic Action and Uh, And he was huge because he was a role model in being extremely successful in business. He was a senior partner at BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. But if you met him to talk about arts festivals or immigrating or integrating skilled immigrants, he was an expert on that, too. So it made me realize that as a business leader, you, you can do what your job says. And then you can also use your brain and the people around you to help your community in really powerful ways. And and uh, so that's made me pretty good about sharing my own time and and resources, but also not being shy about asking business leaders to do that themselves. Um, Ratno Maidvar is another person I met through Civic Action. She just became a senator, but she came to Canada as an immigrant, uh, Indian immigrant from Iran via Germany. And she ended up leading some of the uh, most powerful initiatives we have to help immigrants and refugees and fearless and never loses energy and passion for things. And she made me think about how do you refuel your passion and that you always have more to give and there are always more problems to solve. So those are, those are two, um, two people who've influenced me a lot. And, um, probably more recently, there's, uh, uh, someone who I, I, I count as a friend, Willa Black at Cisco, and she has a commercial role there, but she's figured out how to use Cisco's resources to create something called Connected North that's bringing uh, education and connections digitally to people in very remote communities in Canada. Um, so she's a bit like the David Pico. I, I love people who are are using their resources and connections in ways way beyond what their job calls for. I think that's really cool. Given your examples, what do you look for in a good leader? I look for someone who's 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 willing to listen, who's pretty fearless, who doesn't think they have it all figured out, who's willing to um, admit what they don't know and ask other people for help. Um, and I, I think can be there for their 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 staff and the people around them and be willing to back them up when things get hard. And uh, uh, that's that's what I look for. Um, the leaders who support me now are, are more my chairs of, of the boards that I, I work with. And uh, and I look th- for them to be there when I have a really hard question and I need somebody to, to help me. Um, but as as I said earlier, I, I really do think in Canada, we're lucky that people are, are generally pretty generous about sharing what they know, whether it's as mentors or as chairs or, or, or as friends. And you just have to ask. Outside of influences and people you work with, I know for a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business leaders, they do a lot of reading. So are there any books that you are currently reading right now? So I, I have an admission to make, which is that I am not a big nonfiction reader. Um, I will read articles and things. I do not love that latest Jack Wel- Welch Bush. That doesn't turn me on. Uh, so I tend to go for really good fiction. I'm reading the latest book by Elizabeth Stroud, who's a brilliant writer. Uh, but I do have one nonfiction book uh, on my bedside table, which is called You're It. And it's by uh, two Canadians, Alan Broadbent and Franca Gucciardi. And it's about having your first CEO job. And and it might be useful for any entrepreneur because most of us haven't been CEOs before. He's a very experienced CEO. She was a new CEO and it's sort of a how-to guide for being a CEO and the things that come up. And uh, um, I think that's pretty interesting reading and something I've never seen before. I mean, that's the first time I heard of it and it's really applicable to, to those who are listening here, whether they're an entrepreneur or even a young professional looking to grow their career. Uh, just getting the thoughts, it sounds like it's I'll definitely put it on, on my uh, to-do yeah. read. Yeah, very easy read, very, very practical and how-to. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. But before we end, what final thoughts or observations, or maybe actionable recommendations that you can share for the future business leaders who are looking to grow their career? I think a, a 
big thing is, is building your networks and uh, treating people the way you want to be treated because it always will come back to haunt you or to help you. And uh, I can count uh, so many times where people I met 20 years ago have helped me with something um, that I'm dealing with now. So building networks means you've got people to to give you ideas and help and money and all those things you need to succeed. And the uh, the second big thing is to to always be on the lookout for opportunities and figure out how you can you can go after them. And I say that to my son, who's a little junior banker at BMO. I say it to an entrepreneur who's building a business. You you need to keep looking for that next opportunity and, and really be willing to go after it because otherwise it may not work out for you. No, 100%. I agree. So to close, Julia, please tell us where we could find more information about you, Futurepreneur, and anything else that you'd love to share. Our website is www.futurepreneur.ca. And Futurepreneur is a made up word. So it's F U T U R P R E N E U R dot C A. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Julia Deans. And that's probably the best way to reach me. And we would love to hear from anybody who's thinking about starting a business or who might like to mentor others who are doing that. I had a wonderful time, Julia. Thank you for joining me on the Business Leadership Podcast. You're a star. Thank you for the chance. Bye. Thank you for listening to the episode. Pretty cool hearing about Julia's career and how she finds it important to build your network because it's pretty amazing the people you can meet, how you can learn, how you could grow, and how others also do so in your network. If you're interested in learning more about Julia, Futurepreneur, or any other resources that she mentioned, I've posted the links on our website but feel free to go directly to this episode's page by going to thebusinessleadership.com slash 017. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out directly via email. My email address is edwin at thebusinessleadership.com. We are currently serving our listeners to learn more about you. Please take a few minutes and visit our website and click on the survey link found on the homepage. Thanks again, and until next time, Edwin signing off. Thank you for listening to the Business Leadership Podcast at thebusinessleadership.com.